it's, it's exciting to be here and um, really be in a place where we're talking about an important issue that I don't think we talk about that much. And that's why this symposium so, is so important. It's really a great opportunity to bring stakeholders together um, and really discuss the importance of the Arctic, not just to northern states like ours, but to our entire region, to the world, and especially at a critical time right now when the Arctic Council Chairmanship is passing from the United States to Finland just next month. Um, this is an, a key time for us to come together and to talk, and I wish I could be here the whole, through the whole symposium. Um, I'm a firm believer, and we need to do this more in Congress too, I'm a firm believer that when people come together, discuss issues and problems, that's how we find the best solutions. And there's no one answer to how we address sustainability in the Arctic, but I definitely believe if we bring scientists and industry, technologists and policymakers together, we're gonna come up with the best answers and the best results. Um, I always say that I live in the better Washington, and um, so everyone here is supposed to agree with that, but uh, the, the Pacific Northwest really is home to, is, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's home to our beautiful national forests, um, parks, mountains, and waterways, and in order to protect our environment and our wild places, um, we also have to make sure that we look at the Arctic and realize that um, we all have the growing challenge of climate change that we need to address um, to, to protect our beautiful spaces. And this is an urgent issue and something we should, be, should have been working on more yesterday, but absolutely um, need to continue to work on without delay. Um, and the Arctic really presents a unique example for how important um, it is that we address climate change. Um, as the Arctic warms, um, we here in the Pacific Northwest see coastal flooding, ocean acidification, and extreme temperatures. Um, this affects our local economy, um, and, and affects it immeasurably, I would say, um, from commercial fishing to tribal treaty rights, um, from agriculture to outdoor recreation, uh, and, and it, it affects our economy and our wildlife and our way of life. And so that should make it one of the top priorities that we have. Yet in the other Washington, um, there are too many people denying the facts. Um, I started my career as a scientist, so it's important to me that we look at facts. And we definitely have uh, elected officials today who are still saying that climate change is a hoax. Um, but those who live near the Arctic um, know all too well that climate change is far from fiction. Um, so in this time where we have been talking about our alternative facts and the kind of the ongoing effort, echo chamber there is very dangerous because science is science and there's nothing alternative about it um, and science really should not be a partisan issue and, um, and we need to figure out how to get back to using data and facts to help inform our decisions. Climate change is a serious threat to our way of life, our economy, and our children, and not to mention the future of the planet. And so our country and the international community really must take meaningful steps to build a new economy based on clean, renewable energy sources and reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. Um, regions like ours can lead in the growing green economy. We have you know, innovation, um, um, we have the workforce, and if we can bring ideas and new opportunities together, um, we can make a huge difference, not only here, but throughout the world. So one example, Iceland's use of geothermal energy is an amazing example of this. I know the ambassador is here. I just had a chance to say hi to him out in the hallway. Um, and we collectively need to develop alternative forms of energy like solar, wind, hydro, and biofuels. And in Congress, I'm a member of the Arctic Working Group. It's a bipartisan working group that includes Congressman Young, who I know is gonna be speaking with you tomorrow. Um, we as a group discuss many critical issues throughout the region, including ensuring there's an ambassador at large for Arctic affairs. I'm also a member of the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition, we call it the SEEK. Um, and we've been working to build a green economy really use innovative ideas and solutions um, to address climate change, not only for our environment, but for our health and the health of future generations. 
Um, I represent the first congressional district, and as, as was mentioned, my district goes from the east side of Lake Washington up to the Canadian border, a very large district, a lot of land, a lot of diverse areas. Um, and just in this district alone, we have an incredible opportunity to lead in these efforts. We do have an educated workforce, an innovative workforce, um, where many new technologies have been developed. We have advanced manufacturing um, and, and an ongoing growing technology um, industry. And when we talk about technology, technology isn't just an industry in and of itself. It impacts all industries and, and provides new opportunities as we look at problems across the board. And if we can do that right here, I think we can do that um, and expand that throughout our country and definitely around the world. And also right in here in Seattle, as many of you know, we host an icebreaker, which does research on changes occurring in the Arctic, and as well as helping vessels that get caught in ice. And, and we need to ensure that important resources like that remain funded during our upcoming budget negotiations, which is a challenge because we have a budget right now that um, is going to expire on April 28th. So when we get back in Washington, D.C., we need to make sure we're talking about how we fund the government on April 29th. Um, so it's definitely, though, past time we invested in an icebreaker fleet that meets today's needs. Um, these smart investments that we would make would actually save us money in the future. Um, we shouldn't be stuck using 1970s technology while countries like Russia continue to strengthen their presence in the Arctic and when we have the opportunity to do so much better. Um, our new administration has had a, had a troubling record when it comes to Russia and unfortunately most of the rhetoric regarding foreign policy has crept towards isolationism and that weakens ties between some of our strongest allies. Creeping isolationism is a threat to our economy and to our alliances and our reputation as a country and an ally that honors our commitments. And we know that places like the Arctic will only grow stronger through mutual collaboration, which is why we need to work together to ensure we have bipartisan, multilateral support for cooperation in the region. Um, only through true cooperation and a strong US position, a strong domestic investment in the region, can we ensure that our energy, our resources, tourism, and other Arctic interests are protected? And, you know, I am someone who loves the outdoors, who loves hiking, and um, that's where I would be even today um, if I could be. And I know firsthand how important our environment is to the quality of life in, our, our, in the Pacific Northwest. And taking care of our natural resources, preserving our environment, protecting our wildlife and all the people who live here is critical to maintaining, uh, to, to maintaining this region. And, and our region is, no, is, unlike, uh, or is unlike others in terms of its beauty, but these needs and the, and the issues that we face are issues that are faced throughout our country and frankly around the world. Um, I really applaud the work that's happening here, all that you have done to build a global community together around all Arctic policy to discuss and come up with solutions. And I look forward to your continuing work here and my ability to continue to partner with you and do what I can um, from my position. I wanna thank you so much for having me here today. And I know um, there's, a, there's a, the, the high technology being used here for, for questions, so I'm happy to take a few questions while we have some time. So I will open it up and I think they're magically gonna appear on the screen here, <laughs> supposedly. Um, first question says, Congresswoman, how do you see Alaska and Washington strengthening their economic ties with regards to economic development? Um, you know, I think actually we have a very close relationship and I know the senators here and she can um, answer this question as well. There, not only is it about proximity, but we, we share in our conversations about natural resources, many conversations on fisheries and how we manage our fisheries throughout the region. Um, we, ca we also can work together to protect, um, protect our natural resources. We work together when we look at um, what happens not only in fisheries, but with um, looking at ocean acidification and other threats to our, our common region. So I think it is about dialogue. I think it's about understanding what 
solutions are possible and then working together in a bipartisan way to make that happen. And I do think that that there has been good cooperation and there's probably more that we can continue to do, but I think there's a good dialogue between our two states and, um, and we'll continue to work together to um, come up with some, some good solutions for the region and to discuss the challenges that we face. Um, the other question was, how do you feel that Alaska and Washington can strengthen their ties to support a better future for the Arctic, which I think is kind of a similar question. Um, I, d I don't feel that there is, I, I don't feel that there is a, a focus on the Arctic as much. Um, I know I was talking to the Senator right before coming down here and she of course talks about it all the time. I think more generally, it's something that is on the back burner for many folks and we have the opportunity in our region where it is much more front and center and we can see the impacts more directly to lead that conversation. And so I think it's incumbent on both of us to lead that conversation um, to make it a priority um, for others in our country too. Um, what can you tell about current, but what can you tell us about the current budget for icebreakers? Are they going to be built or not? Um, that's a really good question, and I would say um, I'm concerned about our budgeting process. As I, as I mentioned, we've been operating on something called a continuing resolution, which means we haven't had a real budget this fiscal year. We're only funded through April 28th, and when we go back, we will be, um, we go back um, in the House, we go back on the 25th. So we have between the 25th and the 28th to figure out what we do for the rest of this fiscal year, which would be from April 29th through the end of September. That's probably the, the most expensive and least efficient way to budget because pe they, people can only look forward in a short-term way. Um, you would never run a business 60 or 90 days at a time, and it's definitely not a way to run the government. Um, and it also means that we don't look at long-term investments that we should be making. And um, things like investments in icebreakers are gonna be critically important, but we need to make sure we make the investment. It doesn't help if you get a project started, you need to see that through. So, um, so I am concerned because we struggle to put a budget together and to have the regular appropriations process or, where we would allocate dollars and be able to have a discussion on issues like, like um, like investment and icebreaker. So if we don't get the process fixed first, then we're not gonna get to discuss some of these issues in more detail. And I guess right now my, I, my biggest concern is we don't even have a process that's working well. Um, and we're gonna find out soon enough when we get back if we can do that. The president has submitted a budget, uh, that uh, his skinny budget, um, I think that, that budget definitely would not um, foresee investments in icebreakers per se, but um, that's not really necessarily the budget that we will be looking at and taking up, for example, in my committee and the budget committee, there will be a congressional budget put together, but it's really gonna be in the appropriations process where we talk more about um, these investments. So I think it's an important area. I know folks have been, um, in our region, have been focused on this, but like I said, I'm very worried about the process and our ability to get there. Um, are you open to building the icebreakers abroad for a fraction of the price in half the time? <laughs> um, clearly, I, wa I want to know who asked the question um, and where they're from. And um, but uh, yeah, we have to talk about w what it is that um, we need to build and make sure those uh, uh, investments are there. Um, so that's definitely something that is probably much further out there. Um, Congresswoman, I know the offshore drilling and Anwar drilling isn't popular here, but oil produced in Alaska Arctic fuels Washington's refineries and its cars. As we work towards cleaner energy, can we get to some agreement on keeping Alaska's pipeline full? I was slowing down because they're still typing it out. Uh, um, as I mentioned before, we have refineries here. I have two refineries in, in my district as well, up right near the border. Um, we need to be making investments in clean renewable energy. That is our future. We will use fossil fuels today and we need to make that transition, but we need to make sure we're making investments so we can make that transition. And that's my biggest concern is we are not making those investments to help um, move forward and frankly move forward in a way that it would be much more timely. 
and um, whether it's through tax policy, through um, basic research, these are areas where we, we make investments that I believe can give us a great return and provide us a great path into the future. And so I wanna see us making investments there. I think the, the um, you know, kind of current fossil fuel industry has been a profitable industry. And so we need to think about how we help incentivize investments into clean renewable energy. And that's like where I would like to see us put our, our efforts. Um, so someone said, thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you for speaking, Congresswoman. You mentioned science is an important factor in the Arctic. Would you like to highlight any examples of sciences being used successfully in policy and diplomacy? Um, I actually think science has been used, science and data and uh, ha have been used throughout policy making and decision making uh, around the world. And we have, recently lost, uh, lost a focus there, lost an ability to kind of use science to inform us going forward. It's definitely here in the US that has become a challenge and I'm very concerned about that because if we can't at least agree on where we're at today, it's hard to anticipate where we're going or to measure where we're get, whether we're getting there. And in all sectors, whether it's in, um, in our, you know, looking at natural resources and in energy, whether it's in healthcare and new therapies and treatments, science has informed how we've moved forward. Our investments in basic research have led to great learnings that have spurred innovation. And new technologies are helping us as we learn to um, use them to measure energy efficiency or to, um, to understand so a doctor far away can, can see the healthcare of a patient without them having to come in, in the office. Uh, if we don't continue to allow new researchers to have opportunities to do their research and to receive funding, if we don't um, learn from and provide basic research to learn to create new innovations and to um, solve problems, I think we will go backwards. We, if we lose scientists that are in place today and we aren't able to help, help create kind of that new workforce of scientists in the future, that's going to set us back decades. You know, science isn't something and research aren't things that you can fund in a, in a sporadic way where you give people a few dollars today and then you put it on hold for a year and come back again. These are things where constant resources are very important. And sometimes the best learnings we have are the, from the things that didn't work. And so I've heard from many research, researchers, they're concerned that we're only investing in things that kind of are sure things versus investing in really new ideas that maybe folks don't understand um, where, what the result might be. And yet we've had great learnings when we've, when we've made those investments, sometimes because they worked the way we thought or sometimes because they didn't and we learned something critical that helped us going forward. So investments in, um, in the National Science Foundation, for example, um, on the healthcare side and NIH, those have given us a great return on our investments and those are areas that have been proposed for cuts in our budget. I would hope that we would make strong investments there so that we help build that strong scientific basis for the future. And um, I, think, uh, I think I'm in the red here on the, on the clock. So I'm going to say thank you so much for allowing me to spend a few minutes with you here today. Thank you for the work that all of you are doing here at the symposium and um, enjoy your, your, the rest of your day. And there, is, uh, there actually was sun outside for a little while, so enjoy the sunshine in Seattle while you can. Thank you.